Tom, thank you for being with us. Welcome to 2021. Our topic today for this video is the US-China relationship in trade, but we have been overtaken by events and I have to ask you to just give us your reaction to what we've seen out of Washington this week. Maybe talk about what you think the damage to America's standing in the world has been as a result. Well, thank you, Arthur, and happy uh, 2021 uh, to everybody. Uh, I remain confident that this will be a better year than last year. Uh, but as you say, uh, events in Washington, D.C. this week are both uh, uh, horrific uh, and, and tragic, and they are a uh, moment to me of political clarity for all of us as citizens of this republic and a reminder of the fact that our Constitution uh, and our democracy and the way that it functions and the relationship among citizens and um, between citizens and their national government is not a self-actualizing machine that just operates on its own, that is somehow indestructible. It's actually quite a bit more fragile than that. And yesterday was a demonstration. Uh, no one should be under the illusion uh, that somehow things that happened in other countries could never happen here. Yesterday, they happened here. They didn't happen by foreigners. They happened by citizens of the United States storming the capital of the United States. For the first time, the capital of the United States has been stormed since the British Army rode horses in and burned the building during the War of 1812. Uh, it is not a proud uh, day. Uh, it is a sad day uh, for our country to see that uh, happen. Uh, to the direct question that you asked, uh, it is hard to overstate the damage to the reputation and credibility of the United States of America as a beacon of liberty and democracy to the world, which we have been for literally decades, uh, to, for other people around the world to see on television what we all saw yesterday uh, is going to damage our standing in the world uh, substantially and for a long time. The veneer of democracy will not be sustained and maintained without the active participation of a well-informed citizenry and responsible leaders. Let's turn to the specific subject that um, is the focus of this video, which is the United States relationship with China and specifically related to trade, which impacts agribusiness and farmers and, and many, of other, many other of our customers. What do you expect to see and what do you hope to see once we get through the next couple of weeks and we have a, a change in the administration uh, regarding the U.S.-China relationship and trade? I have said here and other places that the most important bilateral relationship in the world for the rest of my life is the relationship between the United States and, and China. Absolutely unchanged in my opinion on that. Our news cycles are dominated by a variety of other things, as we all, as we all know. But once some of the, the fog of all that uh, starts to dissipate, uh, and, and you know, we're now long well through the process of selecting our, our, our leaders. We know who our leaders at the congressional and executive branch level are going to be. Uh, once, the, once those people get into their positions, the realities of the world and the realities of our economy and our interests will reemerge. Uh, and the requirement to deal with the, the, the colossus uh, in every respect that China represents, will be front and center. Uh, and as we know, uh, this is a unique opportunity and a distinctly unique challenge for us to uh, grapple with, not for a short period of time, but for the rest of our lives. Uh, because our economies are massively interdependent and they cannot be made uh, you know, they cannot be disentangled and disaggregated at the, at the drop of a hat. Let's bring up a chart to look at, which illustrates what you were just talking about. This shows the total value of trade, exports and imports between China and the U.S. over the last uh, five years. You can see that the number for 2020 is actually slightly higher than it was in 2019. I think 
a lot of people will be surprised by that, given that COVID was with us for most of last year and presumably would have disrupted a lot of trade. And yet we're, we're up a little bit this year. What's your, uh, what's your thought on that? COVID did disrupt a lot of trade, but not for very long, right? The underlying reality represented in this, in this graph, though it's much more complicated than just this graph, is, as I said, that the United States and China are massively interdependent, right? We can't make those numbers go to zero, even if we want to, because we won't have food on our table or we won't have goods in our stores, right? And then the same is true for, for the Chinese, because these numbers are gross trade turnover, sales and purchases, right? So I'm not surprised that it went down a little after 2018 because we entered a trade war and there was a lot of uncertainty and there was a lot of forced reduction in, in trade. A little bit of the uptick in 2020 comes from the fact that an agreement, a new trade agreement was uh, reached in early, uh, you know, right around about the time COVID went on a rampage, right, in early, uh, early 2020. And agriculture has been the biggest percentage-wise net beneficiary of that, of that, of that agreement. Uh, but, the, but the underlying reality, uh, given the interdependence and the nature of our economies, is we should all want to see that, that uh, graph sloping upwards to the right. We should all want to see uh, more mutually beneficial trade. Uh, if that number goes down on a sustained basis, it's very likely to mean that we're all getting poorer. So I actually am heartened to see that there's a modest uptick in 2020, and I would hope to see that uh, trend continue. Let's go to the next chart, which shows U.S. exports of goods. So this is just U.S. exporting goods to China on a dollar value basis. Here, the increase, the forecasted increase for 2020 is actually much more significant, almost a 20% increase year over year from 2019. A lot of that incremental growth is agriculture. Talk about that. The fact is, uh, as a result of the trade agreement uh, last year, the phase one trade agreement with China, uh, there a variety of sectors have benefited from that agreement, but the biggest beneficiary by, by increased export volume, if that's the way you wanna measure success, has been agriculture. And, and uh, nobody is happier than we are and our customers are that that should be so. Uh, if you look, for example, at the dramatic increase in U.S. soybean exports to China, that's a great story, right? We want more of that, right? Farmers and, and, and ag co-ops across the country uh, are seeing a variety of uh, manifestations of the benefits of that, including rising prices, which means for every bushel of beans people have produced, they're getting a lot better prices than they were one, two, three years ago. Second question on this chart. Do you think that that uh, increase is driven by China's desire or feeling of obligation to live up to the trade agreements that it's executed with us? Or is it but driven more by need on their side? Yes and yes. The Chinese are good business people. They know what their interests are. They're not going to buy stuff that they don't want or need, right? They've needed a lot. Uh, for a variety of reasons to, to having to do with international markets, et cetera, and their own market. Uh, but they also want to appear to be operating in good faith in relation to commitments that they made to the United States uh, last year. Let's go to the final chart, which tells a lot of the same story. This is year-over-year uh, -year changes in ag exports to China by commodity. You know, the direction of change varies um, uh, a bit from one commodity to other. Soybeans, obviously, is the big driver, but a lot of these are up. Again, your reaction to this? This is the next level of detail of what, what I was just talking about. Soybeans are obviously the, the, the big one here, and, uh, and they went up dramatically, right, as did, as did pork. Pork doubled, right? They had a huge disease problem in their, in their pork complex, uh, they had to slaughter millions of uh, millions of animals, and thus they've needed to buy vastly more uh, pork imports, which we're happy to provide. Right. So this is this is really a a good news story. As I've said before, uh, and my friend uh, uh, at the uh, National Council of Farmer Co-ops uh, said so eloquently last year. You know, what's the the long-term strategy for U.S. agriculture? Exports, exports, and more exports. So we want to see this.
despite the undeniable benefits of trade, last question for you, it's also clear that government leaders, military leaders, business people in the West, including the United States, have been undertaking a fairly significant reassessment of assumptions about China in recent years. There's been a lot more skepticism applied to the direction that China is taking um, and a reevaluation of some of the perhaps naive assumptions that were in place at the beginning of this century. Do you agree with that? And if so, what do you think is the right overall posture that the new administration should have towards China? What's the right approach that we should have going forward? What I think has happened in slow motion and quietly and not really part of any kind of public debate is over the last three or four years, we've gone from a, nobody's even thinking or talking about it to a, yeah, we all agree we got a problem here with China, right? So the diagnosis that there's an illness and a problem here is pretty, uh, has taken pretty deep root across the political continuum in the United States. So if you ask conservative Republicans or liberal Democrats and people in between, they'd all kind of say, yeah, we got some problems here with China. We got to figure this out. The way it is now is not optimal. It's not good for us. You know what I mean? They would all use different language to embellish that, but they would all agree on that hypothesis. So too would the political leadership in Germany or Japan or France or the United Kingdom, right? Uh, now, I think what will be different in, in, in the next uh, administration for the next several years is uh, the, the Trump administration's uh, pursuit uh, of how it uh, defined and, and explained its interests was we were going to do everything by ourselves, right? And so we pursued all of our, uh, all of our attempts to resolve issues or reach agreements with, Chinese, with China bilaterally, right? Uh, I think the incoming administration uh, is going to have a more traditional view that you need to maximize your leverage by going after the Chinese in a negotiation where you have Japan, Germany, the UK, France, and everybody, and us all on, on the same side of the table with a common set of positions, because then we'll have more effect uh, to get better results uh, from uh, from the Chinese. That is my expectation of the way the next administration will behave, both from a foreign policy and national security perspective, but also from an international trade and economics perspective. It's a vital topic. Undoubtedly, we'll come back to it in uh, later in the year. Thanks so much, Tom. Pleasure. Good to be with you.